in. And as always, uh, we are grateful for their uh, accommodation. I would also like to thank uh, the director of the Institute of African Studies, Nduka, who just spoke, and his team for putting this together. This is sort of three in one. It is part of the Brown Bag series. Ceremonies and events like that because right now um, there is, uh, for example, a shortage of baby vaccines in Ghana, and people are saying, Well, what's the point of celebrating Independence Day with all of those amount of money instead of just using the, the, uh, the, the money for, for building clinics and, and getting vaccines, right? <laughs> so, in that sense, there's really no point in celebrating, uh, uh, or at least, I mean, having an event that costs money. I think I disagree with that. I think that uh, there should be room for that. I mean, if we if we if Africans or Ghanaians want to basically pay back everything that their leaders have been uh, the bad deal that they have received from their leaders, they, they wouldn't be. Uh, I mean, there are so many things that they would forgo. But I think it's important to mark days like this, and it's important also because it it, it provides a sense of pride, self-confidence, and freedom. And we see this in, in, in several of the freedom fighters uh, that, uh, that, that are long gone. But I also think that it's important because um, Ghana's independence, and I agree with the president on this, the president gave this speech uh, a couple of days ago about the significance of Ghana's independence, that it was the, it was the uh, independence of Ghana that brought together the different groups, ethnic entities within Ghana to the, what is called Ghana today. And so uh, the attainment of, attainment of independence is really uh, what, gave, what gives us the identity and our uh, the common unity that, that will um, put us ahead. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of all the things that I'm going to say now, right? So just the, the summary of the key point, and then, of course, um, I'll give you the details. So the first argument that I want to make is that, I think I've already said this, uh, and it's in the title, that there is a gap between international perception of democratic consolidation in Ghana and local feelings of, of, uh, of the dividend that is coming from, from democracy. Okay, so that's, that's my, my first observation. The second observation is that Ghana's democratization effort or journey over the years uh, has been supported by external aid and, so, uh, and assistance. And, and, I'll, and, and I'll show uh, you some details about that. This is what has helped Ghana to transition from where it used to be, or at least where it was at some point, to uh, stability. But this financial, this foreign assistance has limits, and that, and and we are beginning to we are beginning to see the limit of those assistance. And of course, the assistance is also changing, or the nature of those assistance are also changing. Uh, and the other point I want to also highlight is this idea that some of the changes that Ghanaians are asking or calling for is beyond, like, like I said, it's beyond the control of foreign assistance. And, and, and uh, we have to pay attention to that. The next point is that the critical issue that, in my view, Ghana faces in terms of good governance is the constitutional arrangement that has being set up in a way that I think it was useful for us in the early days, but it's, it's a problem for us uh, in, in the process of consolidation of democracy. My argument is that there is over concentration of power in the executive branch of government. Okay, so, so maybe if that's all you take away from today, that, that, is, that is good enough for me. Over concentration of power in the president. Okay, and, and then lack of principled leadership. What we have had over the years are politicians, not leaders, uh, and and that is a that's a big problem. But the future of Ghana, in terms of its democracy and governance, in my view, largely depends on domestic factors and domestic forces. And, and so, if external support help in our transition to democracy, uh, that support is not going to be enough uh, for the next phase of Ghana's uh, democracy. And so let me begin briefly by reminding uh, some of us the history of Ghana in terms of its political governance, 
stability and instability. I'm, I'm gonna try and make it short, but uh, when Ghana gained its independence in 1957, it was regarded as one of the uh, richest country uh, in, Af in, in Africa. It was the leading producer of cocoa and it's still the number two producer of cocoa in the world. And of course, Ghana was a middle income at the time, measured by, by the capital income. And Ghana was one of the um, countries that had the highest foreign exchange reserves and a strong civil service. And this is a legacy of colonialism that we may not get the time to go, in, go into. And in Chroma, Ghana's first president uh, really instituted a number of initiatives, including free education, and healthcare, and mass industrialization, and electrification, and what have you. And this program, these programs really uh, ensured that Ghana uh, enjoyed some economic stability. However, by the, by, by the mid 1960s, uh, there were growing economic difficulties and accusations of intolerance for political dissent against the government. And so in 1960, Ghana had its first uh, coup d'etat. The Nkrumah government was overthrown. Uh, now we know that the, those who overthrew Nkrumah uh, actually got support from uh, Western powers to overthrow him. And so there, were, there are a number of reasons there, but by the early 1960s, Nkrumah had moved Ghana into a one-party state with the CPP as the only legal political party in Ghana. And Kuma also introduced the Preventive Detention Act, which basically allowed persons that were considered to be a threat to uh, national security to be detained without trial. And in, 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 I mean, I, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that uh, there were those who disagreed with the Kuma's approach, and then there were those who also uh, just were scared of, of his, his vision and his influence. The overthrow of Nkuma really set the state for an era of political instability. Within a space of about three decades, uh, following independent Ghana witnessed four military uh, dictatorships and four democratically elected governments. So if you look at the chart that I have there, um, after the coup, Ghana was returned to civilian rule under uh, Buzia. And then of course, we had a coup by Champo and his, and his colleagues in 1972. Uh, and of course, they had a palace coup there as well. But um, 1979, we have the coup by uh, Rawlings and the uh, Revolutionary uh, Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, the AFRC. And then, of course, Rawlings handed over power to the civilian government of Dr. Hillary Mann. And, and then, of course, within a few months, uh, Rawlings came back to another coup d'etat, uh, this time under the. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was fun under the PNDC. And of course, it was during the PNDC time under Rawlings that Ghana returned to uh, multi-party constitutional democracy. So this is the fourth republic. You, you would hear me making reference to the fourth republic or fourth republican constitution of 1992. Now, so let's now go into some of the things that happened. Uh, I mean, that we can consider as the, the beginning of Ghana's transition to uh, democracy. In, a lot of people would agree that in Ghana, the combination of both domestic and, and um, external factors led to the democratization effort. In fact, the PNDC government was very hesitant to introduce multi-party democracy. And so it had to make a, a U-turn on that uh, later on in the uh, late 1980s. But a combination of both domestic uh, political resistance by civic groups of, and organizations uh, in Ghana against authoritarian rule, and I can't emphasize this enough, domestic political resistance, okay? Call for the, for the promotion of good uh, political governance and, and that led that joint forces what, what, whatever was happening uh, globally uh, in the context of the third wave of democratization. So one of the things I want to see here is that external factors played an important role, although were very much indirectly uh, in Ghana's move from basic military dictatorship to multi-party democracy in the late 1980s and then the early 1990s. 
so by January 1991, the PNDC government led by Rollins, uh, who had come to the uh, barrel of the gun as an electric coup d'etat, uh, now introduced the agenda or the, the timeline for transition to multi party democracy. And the constitution, after going through the, I mean, deliberations with, with so many constituents within the country, including um, women, uh, led to a referendum which was passed in April uh, of 1992. That really lifted the ban on political parties. So now, um, all political parties that have been banned will now participate uh, in the democratic process. But what we also witnessed is that obviously in the 1992 elections, um, the opposition party boycotted the parliamentary election. So what we really had uh, in 92 was a, a, a parliament that was dominated largely by this the ruling party, who had basically changed from the PNDC to the NDC, which I'll be talking about later on in my, in my talk. So, so there was some space for opposition to operate, but they basically did so from outside of parliament. Okay, and that's very important. Uh, even though they could influence decision-making at the official level of power, uh, I mean, they were very limited in the ability to make any changes to the government. Now, I want us to spend some time a little bit on, on some of the factors that I had there because I think these are, these are critical. Foreign aid to Ghana increased substantially since the successful economic reform of the 1980s, and especially after the return to constitutional democracy or constitutional rule in 1992. And I want to give some few uh, examples here, how external support helped in, in creating the com competitive and credible multi-party elections in Ghana, and how that has, is changing and how that could potentially be uh, a problem, but in my, in my view, it's actually a very good problem. So external aid and competitive uh, and com credible multi-party elections in Ghana, what we notice here is that uh, the, the 1992 elections, like I said, was very much, I mean, uh, was a fraud election. Uh, a lot of scholars will agree on that. Uh, but for the 1996 elections, okay, external donors invested a lot of money. So the United States, for example, through the USA, committed $9 million, which uh, basically helped the, the, the running of the elections. And, and this has been the case since, since then. Almost every four years when we have elections in Ghana, it is supported uh, by uh, external uh, powers. Now, not every aspect of the elections, but, but I'll come to that later on. So the US, USA, for example, committed to provide on-site technical support to Ghana's electoral commission. And some of the funds that were given to Ghana also went into uh, election materials, equipment, and, and technical assistance. The, 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 Danish, the Danish government also provided $3 million to replace uh, the ballot boxes that Ghana used to use were, what we call, were very opaque. You could not see when somebody puts in the ballot paper and you can't see. So, so that was, there was a problem with that. So we moved away from having ballot boxes that were not trans that were opaque to, to transparent ballot boxes. And, and this uh, received funding, especially from the the Danish government. The UK government gave millions of uh, dollars for voter registration forms and equipment. Uh, uh, and, and we can see that in, in, in so many instances. The other area which I think is very important is how through the inter-party, uh, what is called the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC. This is basically Formed, this was formed in 1994, where you know, the political parties come together with the Electoral Commission okay, to sort of think through what are some of the specific concerns that the political parties have when it comes to the conduct of elections. Okay? And of course, this was received uh, generous, you can call it that way, generous funding uh, from, uh, from the UK government and others to help with that. So the point I'm trying to make with this, to this, this slide here is to highlight how external uh, donor contributions 
not only helped with the conduct of competitive elections, because 92 elections were not competitive at all, right? 96 and, and onwards, we see competitive elections. And what the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, when it comes to political party development in Ghana, uh, even though the quest for the formation of political parties comes from within, from Ghana, the support that comes from outside is very critical, especially for smaller parties. And, and we have seen that play out. Uh, but by far, the area where I think there has been strongest support from external uh, donors is in the area of support for the media and civil society. And so um, we have seen this. I can talk about, I mean, the, the parliament itself has received a lot of support, but I want to focus a little bit on, on civil society and the media uh, because that's an area that I'll be coming to later on. As, as you would notice, the, civil, the media and civil society in Ghana has been very important actors when it comes to Ghana's governance process. Unlike some other African countries, civil society groups are critically important uh, and the media, uh, so here I'm talking about private FM and radio stations, but um, well, there was a time during the culture of silence, there was a time in the history of Ghana that private radio was not allowed. And of course, I'm sure that's not just typical of Ghana. This was the case across a lot of other countries. Um, but when it comes to the uh, promotion of PGRI elections, uh, the media has played a very important role in that over the years. But the point I want to emphasize here is this idea that what you see over the years is that external donor assistance has been also very critical for the development of the media uh, and civil society groups. A lot of civil society groups actually get funding uh, from outside, outside of Ghana. But let me be quick to also highlight a few things about what I'm just describing. Know that no matter the amount of external support, aid, assistance that comes from outside is a domestic consistent domestic connection that is able to build, that makes it work. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that external assistance succeed in pushing democratic reforms if it meets the commitment of local uh, Ghanaian elite, especially uh, those that are in power and those that are in the opposition, okay? So, that's, that's, that's an important qualification. It's not to say that Ghana's democratic journey has been largely uh, driven by outside forces. Uh, it's internally, uh, the support comes from, 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 from within and it it's, uh, converges with external interest. Here are the other two things that I, I think it's important to take note of in terms of the limit of external support. So, uh, External support or donor support has had very little impact on the problem, for example, of state capture. And state capture here, I'm referring to how um, when a political party wins elections or when a government is formed, it's basically a time of something we call the winner takes all. Right? The, once you win power, you're basically in charge of almost every uh, every sort of state resource, okay? And then the, the problems with the 1992 constitution, which by the way, I'll come to this shortly, but the 1992 constitution, which has been uh, the, the constitution that ushers us into the multi-party democracy uh, has huge problems. And, uh, and a point I'm trying to make here is that there is no amount of external or donor support that will change that. That, that uh, comes from within, in my view or at least the impact, the, the, the political will should come from, from, uh, from within Ghana. And then of course, issues of corruption and what have you, yes, external actors may have some role to play, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a domestic sort of issue in some sense. But the other thing we are seeing in terms of limit of external support is that what we are seeing increasingly is the role of non-traditional partners like China that are providing uh, support to uh, Ghanaian elite and Ghanaian government. And the argument here is that uh, their approach to the support to Ghana is a little different from what we have experienced in the past. Okay? 
and that's that's uh, that's that's very important. Okay, it is important because China is not going to come and support civil society group within the Ghana to ask for uh, political reforms. Okay, and although it may look like some of the ideas that I'm showing here. Basically, it's calling for external support all the time. That's not, that's not really, that's not what I'm seeking to suggest here. What I'm, what I'm explaining here is that if you look at the history of Ghana's journey from where it was to where it is now, the transition to multi-party democracy has had the support of external donors, and that is changing. And, and I want us to pay attention to that. So it is within this context that that kind of China, China or China's relations with China becomes very important, because what we are seeing is a huge increase in terms of political and economic relationship between not just Ghana but with, uh, African countries and China, and and China is financing um, a lot of projects, infrastructure, what have you, and this is raising questions about debt. Okay, that's one. China's economic influence, but also raising questions about democracy and political influence as well. And, and, and I can talk about this like in the whole lecture on its own, but I want to just mention a few things because both domestic and international democracy advocates are worried about the ability of African democracies to get uh, money and other resources from China without a democratic conditionalities. Uh, and pressure from Western uh, donor typically that insist on um, that they insist on, right? And, and the argument here is that it could undermine the effort to promote more democratic and accountable governance across the continent. So this is this is the uh, this is the situation. But I mean, I think we need to know that um, for China is a, is a big power. In, in, uh, in Ghana and, and across Africa. Now, if you look at if you look at it, uh, China's influence, its investment, and its engagement here has sort of cut across several areas. But we can focus on infrastructure for a moment, and and we see here that uh, the combined, if you combine all the other support that infrastructure support that is coming in from from outside of Africa. In some sense, Africa as well, especially the African Development Bank. China has invested more in Africa than all the other top eight lenders combined together. Okay, so, so it's a big deal. But at the same time, um, when it comes to questions about debt, currently about um, 40, well, about 1.7 billion of Ghana's current bilateral debt is owed to China. And there's an on interesting ongoing. Uh, Sort of discussing about um, whether China will join the forces with other multilateral uh, institutions to forgive or at least to restructure Ghana's uh, debt. And I think that is uh, something that we, we, we have to pay attention to. But yeah, one of the things we need to take note of here is that China has a, a different sort of approach, or, or I mean, when it comes to it, its engagement across Africa and, and, and its. Even if China doesn't say it, it's quite obvious how it goes about it, right? It prioritizes uh, economic right over uh, political right. And so we can't expect uh, China to get Africans to be more democratic. And maybe that's actually a good thing. Uh, and, and I'm going to run here a little bit because I have a few things to share uh, on the other side that I'm not there. Uh, but we see, a, we see a difference in terms of uh, how Western countries have engaged Ghana and other African countries over the years compared to how China has done that. Uh, and not only in the area of uh, the issue of non-interference in domestic affairs, right? Uh, but they also, there's now a new discussion about China may not necessarily be interfering in our producing of authoritarian regimes in, in, in Africa, but the nature of it engagement, especially in export of technology. And, and this is another area that there's a lot in here, but export of technology through its Chinese company is actually emboldening some of authoritarian regimes across Africa. And that uh, is a concern. So in some sense, with this argument, the point is that 
people are worried that China is exporting, uh, they can, uh, exporting authoritarianism, even though it's not doing it uh, directly, or at least the China model uh, is, is influencing um, African countries. But there's a very interesting development that is going on, even though Africans or when you Afrobarometer has in presence every year, when you interview Africans on the continent, uh, even though they welcome China's influence, they also maintain democratic aspirations. So, uh, so yeah, they, they, they make these sort of distinctions that uh, they, they are not interested in going to China in terms of political governance, uh, but they are happy to take uh, they are happy to take uh, China's um, economic in, uh, goods that come. In. Now, let me go to what I really want to talk about today, which is now. Uh, I don't know if I have my camera out there. Uh, I'm still good. I'm all good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So, so here, here, here is what I want you to 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 think about. There is a there is a there is a uh, constitutional expansion within the within the Ghana uh, Ghana democracy. There's a problem, and this is not new, with the separation of powers in terms of the relationship between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And basically, what it, in some, what it is is that the executive, which is the president, has undue powers compared to the legislature and the judiciary. And in fact, that those undue powers are actually um, making it difficult for the legislature to perform its roles uh, in a way that would really deepen the democracy that Ghana has. And, and I'll speak to that a, a, a little bit more. So some people have called this, uh, this sort of arrangement that makes the president so powerful as the president be the imperial uh, president. The 1992 constitution is a hybrid constitution in the sense that the create institution, especially the parliamentary the, the, the legislature, it fuses the executive and the legislature, if, even though it's a presidential system. So we have a president, we have a parliament, but the, 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 the constitution basically requires the president to appoint majority of its ministers, which is the executive, from parliament. That is a big problem. And it's a big problem, not just because of the name, but it's a big problem because of what we have seen over the years uh, within, within Ghana. So let me, let me tell you a few things here. In, in, the, in the Ghanaian context, the president appoints almost everybody. Okay? The president, I'm going to give you a lesson. It's, it's not exhaustive. There's a lot of big things here that I, I'm, I'm going I'm to jump. The president appoints the ministers and deputy ministers. And the constitution places no limit on how many ministers he can appoint, he or she can appoint. Okay? So what's going on, in, in, or what has been going on is that the president appoints so many ministers. Now we have over 100 ministers that are running a country of 30 million people. The president appoints the chief, of, chief, chief justice uh, in consultation with uh, uh, the Judicial Council. The president appoints the electoral commissioner and, and their deputies. The president appointed the Auditor General and Special Prosecutor. The president appointed the Inspector of Police, the Chief of Defense Staff, the Chief Executive Officers. This is a big one of state, of, of almost all boards and, and, and various statutory corporations all across uh, uh, the country. The mayors are appointed by the president. At the district level, municipal, and, and metropolitan level. There's just a whole list that I can I can add more. Now, this is a problem, not because of the power that he has to appoint, but there is very little check or limit on the exercise of that power. Okay, so that's just that's just one thing. The next thing that I want to highlight is the idea that the parliament um, that is supposed to have oversight uh, sort of duty to on the executive is very constrained by the executive powers because we the president appoint majority of his ministers from parliament. What is basically happening is that you have um, 
So a couple of things. In that, when, when you have uh, the president appointing all the ministers and deputy or ministers from parliament, then what you have here is that you have members of parliament that are also part of the executive. And so when it comes to, to issues that the, the parliament is supposed to debate on that may not necessarily go well for the president or that may be critical of the pre president, that is, that is, that is a, a challenge because they cannot criticize the, the government that has appointed them to that. Right, but what is even more is, the, is that uh, until 2020, just about three years ago, the press, the president, the executive was in the only uh, institution that can introduce bill to Ghana's parliament. The constitution doesn't really say it like that, but that's what it is. But what happens is that any bill that would bring any financial implications on the country or the state corporate has to come from the executive. And almost every bill would have a financial attachment. Uh, so that, that was, that's a big problem. And this one, yes, I'm under, uh, uh, in 2020. And guess what? The first uh, private member's bill that is now being discussed is the, uh, the bill that is seen as targeting LGBT communities. Yeah. So that's a very interesting uh, development. Now, beyond the, 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 the parliamentary, the president also appointed the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court. That's not just the problem. The problem is that there is also no ceiling on how many members of the Supreme Court judges the president can appoint. The constitution says minimum of nine. And what we have seen over the years is that he just keep uh, appointing uh, justice, I mean, justices to the Supreme Court. There's a little, a little bit more uh, details in there. Um, that makes it very interesting because what you have is that the minimum requirement for Supreme Court is, I think, is five justices, right? And so when there is an issue, and this is not just with one government, it's different regime over the years, right? What you see is that the empowerment of Supreme Court justices can be very, can be seen to be political because of the appointment that comes in. Now, there's a lot in here, but, but I think we, we can take this for now. Now, because of this, some people have, got, have been calling either for a new constitution or amendment to the existing constitution. And another big thing that I haven't mentioned, Article 71 of the constitution, that uh, really speaks to uh, the framers of the 1992 constitution, in my view, sort of had a very optimistic view of the people that would occupy that office. So, so, so there is not enough check or limitation on, on the president. And that, that is the problem. So if the power that the president has may not necessarily be the problem. The problem is how that power is exercised and how it's been exercised over the years that we have seen, right? It's been, it's been abused and, and to, to a very large extent, uh, very problematic. So there's a, a whole lot of discussion about whether we need a new constitution or amendment of the constitution. And, and because portions of the constitution that needs to be amended to have these things corrected are in trained positions, which means that you don't have to go through a referendum to get it done. So why, why, why is that a problem? What I was describing before, why is that a problem? Because it's a problem because when you have a president that appoints everybody, right? When, the, when those people are, are doing their work, they have little control of the president. And, and what we have seen over the years is that we, have, I can give, we can give examples of the recent um, uh, um, president calling on the, the auditor general to proceed on leave, right? Because the, the, the auditor had, had accumulated leave that he didn't take, so he was asked to go on leave. And then when he came back, uh, he said, oh, well, your retirement is up, so go home, right? But this was happening because the auditor, who is appointed by the president was actually uh, indicting a senior minister, right? So I, I may be sounding a little bit pessimistic about what's going on in Ghana, but that's in my view present a better true story or uh, complete story. The other one that I quickly I want to mention is that I didn't want to talk about corruption because there's a lot in here that that um, uh, that we can talk about. But the question for me when it comes to Ghana is whether democracy is part of the corruption problem or is a solution? Because we have seen that over the years, the kind of competitive elections that we've had 
and the monetization of uh, competitive election is breeding corruption. So what do I mean by that? Let me give an example, right? The, the two main parties which I will come to show you are very much, um, they know, they, 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 my view is the two main political parties have become very strategic and calculative of how to win elections in Nairobi. This, this may not be a Ghanaian, Ghanaian problem with everywhere, but this is not how to win elections. And so what they've done over the years is that they know what to say, what promises to give to, win, to get elected, right? And when they come into power, then it's a completely new, a different thing altogether. Okay, so corruption, of course, is a big problem. But the question, or in my view, the answer to this question about, about corruption is it's not that corruption, the, democracy does not necessarily bring about corruption. What fuels corruption is how democracy, democracy is practiced. And my view is within the political elite in the, Ghan, in the Ghanaian landscape, there is this problem was not the case before, but there's a very, I mean, there are very good politicians out there that are doing the things that we expect them to do. But we have a bunch of them that, mind you, they are not very principled and they have a very limited understanding of the reasons elections are held or the reason we have the democracy that we have. Okay? And, and, and so what we are seeing is when it comes to accountability, right? When you hold a public office and you have mismanaged or everybody sees that you are mismanaging or you are not doing the right thing. The honorable thing to do is to do is to resign, right? Of course, they will, they will not resign because they have a very different way of view about um, why they are there. And that is a very concerning issue. The last thing that I will see here is what I referred to before. If you look at the, the, the statistics here, even though Ghana has a multi party democracy, what we practically have is actually a group called the Chiming Party, the NDC, the National Democratic Congress, and the NPP. Now, these two parties, of course, have um, had very important successes. Over the last eight, uh, eight elections, they've won four each. Okay, so they have a fair sense. But uh, in the last parliament, we we're, were expecting a lot of, uh, we had a very positive view, at least some of us, because of the split. This really happened hasn't happened before compared, I mean, I think the last time was 1979 or so, where there's actually a, almost like a split between the opposition and the, and the party in government with the one candidate who, who was actually an MPP, but ran as an independent candidate, uh, and is now the deputy speaker. So uh, we're expecting a lot more from this that is to be a check on the executive, but it's not happening. And I'll, in conclusion, I guess this is what I really want to highlight. That despite all the uh, pessimistic assessment that I'm giving about Ghana's democracy and the problem that we have, uh, we have a lot of people in Ghana and outside of Ghana that are very critical or that are that no one to give up. But there are also those that are becoming fed up because of uh, all the things that have been going on. So, Ghana's transition to multi party constitutional democracy had strong support from outside, not just in terms of funding, but also in terms of support for um, ordinary citizens and civil society. The global economic crisis, COVID, and everything else that is happening in the changing nature of the global landscape means that the kinds of or the new non traditional partners of, of Ghana. Do not put so much emphasis on issues like on, on issues like democratization. And so the future, I think, now lies with uh, the Ghana side of things. And hopefully we have more people that are not just uh, spectators, but citizens that will put in the challenge to the political elite. Thank you.
So thank you very much for the remarks in honor of Ghana's independence. And I appreciate the kind of uh, reminder of how the way the nation has to be performed, right? Through through those independent speeches, through music and through dance, and, and the way that Independence Day had a meaning in 1957, mm -hmm. of great hope and possibility for Ghana, for the African continent, and then was followed by disappointments of the coup and Nkrumah's uh, increasing authoritarianism as well, and then the disappointments of the 70s, but then this renewal of democracy and how it's how do we keep all those moments right in the in 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 perspective the kind of the palimpsest of, of history what, what did it mean at the time what does it mean to us now and the, um the emotions that are embedded in in that um moment of independence even as people might look back at it from today's perspective and say what have we achieved after 66 uh, years with um that sense of aspirations, but also the, the disappointments of all that to fruition. Um, I wanted to ask too about, um, you know, you, you present the importance of external aid um, and how Ghana's government is in a way um, oriented in a sense to that external aid, how mm -hmm. it's pushed it into democratization. I, I wondered whether in the, the, the switch from being, uh, well, having, having China enter the picture and now Ghana being in a position like other African countries of being able to play uh, different powers against each other, I was just wondering whether that externalization has changed, whether the, the degree of externalization has changed, or whether it's a sort of a similar kind of I guess whether that degree of externalization in some ways works against democratization because then the government doesn't need to respond to its people, right? But I just wondered whether there was a change also in that relationship to how the government is oriented to those foreign powers. Um, and I don't want to take too long because there's um, also, um, anyway, other people have other sorts of questions. Um, I, but the, the, in thinking about the, what's happened with democratization as well, I really, sometimes I think there's been too much focus on elections mm -hmm. and multi-party elections, and that what's been really successful in Ghana is the strength of civil society and the media and the ability of people to feel free to um, express their views and to criticize people, although maybe it never has the kind of success rate that people hope for, right? It doesn't always lead people to account. So I just I just wondered whether what your sense was of kind of are, can, do those things have to go together or are there um yeah should one focus instead on the civil society versus elections, I guess as a as a barometer of the uh, democratization. What would be the implications of that the thought run the big thought running for my mind. Um, um, and then I just thought you might say a little bit about uh, Ghana's response to COVID and what that mm -hmm. says. It's been a sort of a, uh, it's put some <laughs> democracies mm -hmm. in, in peril, though, <laughs> kind of given rise to more authoritarian uh, kind of tendencies. And I just wondered. How, how, what Donna's response was and what your response was. So, I may, I'll just, you can answer those if you like, or we can open it up for other kinds of questions. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to respond to some people and then, and then we'll answer more. So, um, I mean, what, I think, I think what, what, one of the things that we, we saw for it that day, uh, the government of the day, Sort of prioritize uh, the health of citizens as as they portrayed it uh, mm -hmm. over um, over sort of holding up the economy. So, so there's a phrase that I don't know if I can get it directly as well, but the president says something like, "We can bring back the economy, but we can't bring back money." Right? So 
So the approach was that um, they would put in the intervention programs that would help um, people that were uh, suffering. So, for example, um, they had um, waiver on electricity and water bill for some people or, or, or people. And, and so that happened. But at the same time, um, we, we now know, based on some investigations that are coming out, that um, the, at the airport, in Accra, the sort of antigen tests that were done before people come in and go out were a rip off in terms of how much you have to pay. You have to pay $150 or so. Um, to, but that was really, if you look at that, it was way too high. So the argument is that the government went really uh, use that opportunity uh, to get that. But the other thing is that it also, uh, some of the money that it got from the IMF to, to, to do COVID related stuff did not go directly to COVID, even though they went to health, uh -huh. but they didn't have direct impact on COVID. So that's just what, what I would say on that. I, I don't think there is any research that I've seen or any indication that the government now became a bit more authoritarian during this. Time. Briefly on the question of uh, externalization, uh, Ghana doesn't live in a back. And, and out of what I hope that we get is that I'm not suggesting that overnight that there are no, uh, uh, there is no Danida or there's no USB or there's no any of those external actors in Ghana. They are still, uh, they are still present. In fact, in some sense, uh, COVID is probably having them. Uh, Increase some of their uh, engagement in specific social intervention programs. I'm referring more to the, um, the governance side of it. And, and I think that is an area that um, that is not, um, that China is not really feeling that backing, uh, but there is, there is more going there, going on there than we have had over the years. And so uh, now that, that's what I would say. And then maybe if there are, if there are other questions I can. Or comment I can respond to. Um, I just thought we should open it up and then uh, let me and um, say you could keep your questions or your comments very short mm -hmm. so we can take as many as possible. Well. We're actually um, at press right now for time. So keep your questions or comments short. Yes, in the back. Thank you. I, I want to make a comment on the ladies who close the chair on the screen. Yes. And in the process, uh, uh, possibly. Um, also comment on the role that social media and the youth are possibly playing in the building of this active and not spectacle of uh, citizen. Thank you. Thanks. Right, so my question is in two points. The, the first question is that um, the impression I got from your presentation basically like portrays the fact that the kind of benefits or dividends that Ghana has to yield from democracy as a minimum over the past years. Mm -hmm. And if you take countries like um, Rwanda, that is kind of authoritarian mm -hmm. in orientation, there's a bit of high levels of economic development. So would you suggest that democracy isn't really a thing for, for Ghana? Mm -hmm. Is there a need for us to kind of like try and test other forms of government? To yeah. see if we need to kind of achieve a kind of development that we want to achieve as a country. And the second question has to do with the fact that I mean that there's been several arguments over the past years from political commentators that although Kwame Kumar was like tactically cautious, but he was myopic in his quest for independence mm -hmm. because. If you see South Africa, and the, the, I mean, they've been using South Africa as, I mean, a, 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 a combative check that, I mean, the, the Europeans and some other, I mean, colonizers spent so much time in South Africa and they were able to build up their country to some extent. <laughs> so, if indeed, he was able to allow the British, like, govern the country to some extent, he would have experienced the same level of development that. South Africa is currently experiencing. I mean, what is your take on that? Do you agree that if Nkuma had allowed them to like go ahead with their governance process, we would have achieved some radical of success than going there? Okay, okay. So before we continue, I'd like to restrict us to one question, please, okay. so that we can. Okay. 
that's not the time. I know that students would like to be very shortly on some of us as well. So please, let's keep it to one question. And I will probably be able to take only uh, two more relatively. And then we have somebody who is in online for quite a while. So if you don't mind, he has two of you out there. Oh, it's more than more than the first person now. So we'll alternate we'll take one from there and then we'll give priority to people in the house. I didn't want to say that. Okay, we're not giving priority. To <laughs> you didn't hear me say that. Okay. All right, let's 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 take that. So let's see. There's one. Yes, yes and then you can just one, add that. I can see from you, but oh, okay, so, so, okay, I can yeah. ten on you. The first one is: Do you think the problem can be attributed to poor foundational knowledge on the principles and philosophical basis of democracy, especially in designing the constitution and the administrative structures of our democracy? Or one person has more questions. Yeah, I know. Okay, yeah. okay so we'll answer this. Yeah. And then we also going to keep you on time. Yeah. Check. So to the first question about why I have those pictures there, I mean, if you go back to Ghana's history, all the pre pre colonial, colonial times, uh, you would always have, you would always see that Ghanaians, I mean, this is not just me saying the literature based on Ghanaians are very, um, uh, a lot of Ghanaians are very politically aware, conscious, and, and so uh, they, are, they, are, they are able to take on uh, uh, domestic oppressors, let's put it that way. Okay, so, so the list I have there have journalists, I have civil society organizations, and then I think I have uh, a, a movement that, that is to a very large extent fixed the country started online, started on social media. So that is a space that I think. Um, I think that uh, we need to pay attention. There's a lot of political mobilization happening on social media. People are able to speak up uh, their mind that, that they, didn't, they didn't have the opportunity before. And that's a big deal. And, 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 but at the same time, we also have uh, both political parties who have hired people that are also responding to people's posts on social media. So it's, it's a struggle. Uh, the other one, it's a question of, uh, Um, well, I think the, your first question was on uh, whether democracy is actually suitable for that. So uh, that, that's a debate that we can have. Like, we can have that's a whole also. But let me say this: I, I think when it comes to to Ghana, that debate is somewhat resolved. So we can we can make. Uh, I think we can talk about. Have to talk about how democracy is being run, which is why I said that, um, or I agree with the view that it is not so much about uh, democracy producing corruption. If 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 democracy basically leads corruption, then the most corrupt country should be the most democratized country, right? Which may not necessarily be the case. So I think that this perhaps speaks to the first question that I see someone put uh, on on whether there's a problem with for foundational knowledge on the principles. I think that's one of the major problems. I think I know that uh, that's uh, Dr. Ghana that, that posted that question. That's an argument that we have been having on WhatsApp for some time. I think there's a fundamental disconnect. That the, the Ghanaian politician has become, they have become so strategic, like I mentioned before, yeah. about winning elections. And, and, and the, the goal for winning elections, I think, is missing. And the reason for having democracy in the first place, I think, is, is missing out gradually. So I agree that there's a lack of, and the framers, there's a lack of that understanding. And the premise of the uh, constitution, and even the, the Supreme Court right now, in my view, also focuses more on the practicality of things than the substantiveness of issues in, in some cases. And I can give examples, but I don't think we have, we have, time, uh, we have time for that. Look, um, I think um, your last question about whether independence should have been prolonged or should have been delayed, that, that's, that's internal. I disagree with that argument 100%. I, I, I think independence should have probably even come earlier. And, and uh, much as I see the, the effect, the, the, the bad effect of colonialism, 
I think that Nkrumah was right. And uh, especially when he, when he asks for independence now, uh, but if we if we can have some of those issues that Nkrumah had, with, with even some of our leaders, Nkrumah had his, his problems, and I, I will debate, I can always talk about that, but uh, independence was gotten probably even a few years later. Mm -hmm. So we'll take the question from the, from the room. Uh, thank you for your talk. I um, was curious about the way that you characterize China as a non-traditional partner. And I was curious about that because it seems to me, at least, and I'm not an expert on this, but China's involvement actually fits the bill of what Kerma called neo-colonialism. So are you making a claim then that there is a different sort of colonialism beyond neo-colonialism in the way as Kerma theorized it? Or what's the what is the relationship here, I guess, to Kerma's political theory? Yeah, that's a good one. Should I pick one more? No, I think this is the last. Sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, so the, I characterize China as a non traditional partner, largely within the context of the development landscape in terms of uh, the history of Ghana and other African countries. Although, in my own research, I show how the relationship between China and African countries go all the way back centuries before uh, what we have what we have seen largely because of the colonial encounter between Pan Africans and, and the European powers uh, and, and the relationship that has evolved since I mean since uh, independence they, they maintain that traditional relationship right when I say China is a non non uh, traditional uh, partner and I use something I put the word partner in quote because that the engagement is not necessarily a partnership that is that is new. There are aspects of China's engagement in Africa, in Ghana, within specific sectors in Ghana that are exploitative, that in some sense can qualify within Nkrumah's concept of neo-colonials, where you basically have the economy of state being governed by outside forces. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can see elements of that, especially when you look at it in terms of what is going on with debt crisis. But the, the nature and the mechanism by which China engages in um, Ghana and other African countries, in my view, the tools that China uses, the strategy that China uses is completely, is not completely, but it's different from the traditional part. And so um, it's, not, it's not necessarily good or it's not necessarily bad. My view is that Given all that has happened historically, the way China engages African countries leaves a lot of room for African agents. There is a lot of room for Africans to maneuver their engagement. But there is always that problem that I, I think you know, some, some, some Africans are getting and others are not, that they have to see the value that they bring on board when they are negotiating with China. And if, if that recognition comes, my view is that um, that relationship, no matter how big China is in terms of being a superpower, it wants something in Africa, it wants something in Ghana. If we recognize that what China wants, we can get something in return that is sustainable. I think it presents an opportunity much better than what we have had over the, over the last 60 years. Okay, yes. no, I'm sorry, um, this is very fascinating. Like, I think I'm going to ask you more on this talk. So, um, I think I'm going to learn a little bit more. And I thought that you had to take a few more minutes outside of the main time. You didn't have something like refreshments there. Uh, yeah, you can take the last few minutes. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to ask you more on this talk. So, I'm going to ask you more on this talk. So, I'm going to ask you more on this talk. So, I'm going to ask you more on this talk. So, I'm going to ask you more on this talk. Uh, this has been quite um, a very interesting afternoon. And then we also have some light music. Mm -hmm. And you're going to join? <laughs> so join and Isaac was supposed to perform. <laughs> there is some refreshment there, right? Okay, so again, so the refreshments, this is officially ended. But yeah. it's a part of it, I don't think. Man. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, you don't stick around the bit, that's fine. You take a light refreshment, and then you can come back here. Yeah. And, you know, the drumming and, 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 and